All right. Hey, everyone. Good to see you all. Um, so you're here for the exciting continuation of the Shikintaza story. We're in part two. So um, I think there's even going to be a part three. Uh, can I just see, I can see you, most of you in the meeting room. How many of you were here at the last, at Shikintaza part one, the exciting Shikintaza part one? Most of you, yeah. I want to review a little bit of um, uh, of what we did last time, just to kind of reground and because after all, um, practice is repetitive. That's why they call it practice, right? <laughs> we keep doing it over and over. Um, so, <clears throat> and we'll, we'll also have some time for discussion. So I think the best thing is I'd like to do a little guidance just to start, just to point to some of the things we did last time that kind of ground us in. And then I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, for those who weren't here, I know there's a couple who weren't here, so I want to rope them in, but the, uh, the first thing I'd like to do is just reconnect to some of the guidance I get, gave last time. So if you would all make yourselves comfortable in your usual or whatever facsimile of Zazen, position you're able to assume where you're sitting and a couple of the points I made and these all lead us toward cheek and tassel, objectless practice or technique-less practice in a way but there's certain techniques that can help us to get to that threshold so one thing to clarify is meditation in all its forms, especially um, Zazen, the one we do, but in pretty much all its forms, it's, um, yeah, we might use the breath or we might use some other object and the breath has a magic to it. Uh, no doubt that helps us, but the point isn't the breath or whatever object we're using. The point is we're bringing our attention to the present moment experience of our life, which is the only place our life actually occurs. The rest is memory and projection. Those things are valuable, but they're not very valuable when we're doing zazen. So, and what, what this means is bringing ourselves present means that we're practicing reality. So it's not a small matter. It's easy to get lost in the mechanics of our zazen as we repeat it over and over um, and just fall into a mechanical way of doing it. But it can help to inspire us to remember what we're doing is a big thing. We're bringing our entire attention to the actual reality of our lives and we're examining that. And if we want to discover what our life is about in a deep way, where else are we going to find it? So we're not just following the breath or just doing a technique. Um, we're doing something that's kind of profound. And if we remember that, it can help us get beyond just the routine mechanical uh, nature of it. Um, the second thing I want to emphasize is that, is that Zazen is primarily a physical practice. There is a mental component, but most of our mental mental activity is thinking, and that is not what we're doing in zazen, right? So, a lot of our the greater part of our day-to-day uh, -day mental function is not involved. So it really helps to allow to make sure we drop out of our heads and into the body, and it's surprisingly uh, easy. We're going to start with the breath but it's surprisingly easy to be following some idea of the breath rather than the actual breath itself. And where the locus of our attention is, I know we work a lot with the hara, but I also know that many people have trouble connecting with the hara. Uh, and so we might be floating in this kind of nebulous in-between region where we're not exactly plugging into the actual sensations of the breath we're 
we're not necessarily having consistent, steady attention. You know, our practice can easily get uneven and we don't even see it. And I speak from my own, um, my own experience, long experience of practice. I've had, I've gone into uh, long plateaus in my practice and places where I felt blocked and places where I kind of lost the thread, you know, and had to regain it. So um, I hope that, you know, if you go through these um, spells sometimes where your practice loses some vitality or gets flat, that um, some of what we're doing here can help you reawaken. So reawaken yourself to really be um, invested in it in a deep way. So an image a lot of people find helpful for dropping the attention into the body is if you imagine a flat rock tossed into a swimming pool filled with jello, it would slowly make its way down to a resting place in no particular hurry. So in just such a way, our attention can drop out of our heads and find a resting place somewhere in the body. It doesn't have to be the hara. It can be, find the most natural place for your attention to rest. Those of you who've tried to work with connecting with the Those of you who try to work with connecting with the Hara, um, I know it can be difficult for some people, but a good place to start is just be sure we're in the body. And if we use that image of the flat rock in Jello, just slowly coming down and finding a natural place to settle. That's where we start. It's okay if it's in the heart area. It's okay if it's in the solar plexus. But that sense of gravity drawing the attention downward, there's this sense of allowing that is really helpful in connecting with the Hara point. It's as though we just, as we drop deeper, as gravity, we relax and gravity also draws our muscles downward, our mind is also drawn downward and it may, over time, find a way to settle there in the Hara. We'll talk about that more in a few minutes, but for right now, just settling in the body. A manageable way always to start is it's easier to apply our attention to the exhale than to the inhale. This is being awfully nerdy about the breath, but we're going to get really nerdy about it in detail. It's so helpful. Um, one of the, um, one of the issues that determines how deep our practice is, is, um, how continuous our attention is. So let's just start by looking at an exhale. It's easier to keep continuity of attention during the exhale because the exhale, um, naturally triggers the parasympathetic or, or relaxation response in the body. So. What we're working with in, in Sheik and Tazer or just sitting is we're trying to, it's like the Taoist side of Zen. We're trying to find the natural flow and go with that. And if we can find the natural flow to carry us deeper, that's a whole lot better than struggling and striving to get there, right? So if we just start with an exhale, let's just see if we can keep our attention steady just for the duration of an exhale. I'm sure you can all do it. Um, but there's something to be noticed in doing this. So whatever point in the body that your attention has come to rest, if it's the heart, right? If it's somewhere else, that's fine. You've got that close attention on that one point. And I want you to really physicalize your, your awareness of the breath. So it's not like we're watching the breath from a distance. We're as close to it as possible, even ultimately as though we're inside it. Can we, can we notice how much variation in sensation we can actually notice during the course of just an exhale? 
so we know the beginning, middle, and end of exhale, they all feel different. But what about all those points in between? Let's just take a couple moments, and in that, from that, that focused, um, specific point in the body, see how much we can actually notice about the ever-changing sensations of that. See how close we can get to that. Let's just try that for a couple of minutes. So this is a fairly one-pointed brand of awareness here. We're noticing in this granular way how the sensation of breath changes just throughout an exhale. It's really helpful to raise the mind of inquiry. This is what koans do naturally for us. But we raise that mind that's really, it's interested. What have I not noticed before? What can I notice now that I haven't noticed before? It's that kind of attitude. It's not a purely passive attitude. We're actively engaged. How steady can we keep our attention while noticing as much as we can notice? Not in a way that we're straining, in a way because we're interested, we're taking an interest. And it's very helpful to notice that being that close to our direct experience, it has a fairly subtle but definitely palpable feeling of pleasure. So if we let the pleasure in and appreciate that it's pleasant and interesting, all of these things are important supports for where we're going with this practice. Okay, so I want to step out of the practice for a moment and just get some feedback on whether you, some of you, uh, anyone who wishes to speak can tell me, can you see what I'm pointing to here? How's that working for you? Nobody wants to stop sitting, of course, but we're going to ruin it by talking about it. So anybody want to speak on what that's like for you? how that's working, uh, including people at home, you can raise your uh, hand or your virtual hand. Would anyone else just like to share this? Uh, how Futai. That <laughs> Futai, hi, Futai. Yeah, yeah. hi. Um, uh, I was watching uh, the, ro the flat rock uh, just mm. sink through the jello mm -hmm. and uh, it settled in a nest of some kind of green and okay. it was just there so, so so those kind of visual phenomena they're a good sign that we're in, in that were that were uh deepening into our practice and my attitude is we should enjoy the scenery so that's part of the scenery if it helps you get interested in focus but uh, how about behind the visualization were you able to connect in the body? This is what I'm interested in. It can be really nebulous for people, the actual connection in the body. Could you feel, in addition to the visual phenomena, could you feel where that landed? Like, could you point to it, Futa? Yeah, right here. Right in uh, the Hara or the... So in the Hara point. Okay, yeah. so you're able to, to connect there. And can you really feel that nobody's being tested? You know what I mean? But can... <laughs> Uh, oftentimes it's hard to actually feel what the breath is doing in a close way. We're, we're a lot more likely to be following it as though at a distance. Could you get close to it? That's what I'm asking people to do. Get inside uh, the feeling. How was that for you? And as, uh, as the flat rock sank, uh, mm. it, it uh, would sink very slowly on my out breath. Uh, and uh, 
I, I could feel uh, the weight of it, but also the buoyancy of it. So, okay, right. Okay, all of that's good. They, there is some, uh, one of the phenomena that can happen as we connect more deeply is that feeling of weight and or buoyancy. But can you actually feel the movement of the body that happens with the breath? So we know that the, when we're in the hara, a few inches below the navel, the lungs don't extend that far. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, there's movement there because the diaphragm drops into that zone. And so there's, um, so you're obviously a visual person and that's helping you lock into uh, a kind of internal phenomenon that's taking you deeper. But I just want to make sure that you connect to the actual physicality of it too. Um, in your body, can you feel that? Just try it right now. Just with an exhale. What do, what, what do we actually feel? We get close to it. Uh, I could feel uh, the expansion and the contraction of my right, chest. Okay, great. okay, so yeah. And the... Uh, well, of course, on the exhale, you're feeling the uh, contraction, but, and then, and then that, you know, we can, we can be satisfied with broad sensations like contraction, but that's all made up of much smaller sensations, right? Mm -hmm. So the beginning of the contraction, middle of the end, um, you see what I'm saying? Um, there's a whole level of anchoring in the body and in the reality of our lives that happens when we really physicalize it. So, um, so the mind is adding the part that's inquiry. The mind's adding the part of, hey, I want to know this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but our close attention in the physical body is, is um, just very important. So it's very important to drawing us deeper into our practice. Does that make sense to people? Yes. Please remind me of your name. Uteki. 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 Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How is oh, that for you? I noticed that there's an interplay actually between my breath and it's going deeper and my mind because I, I keep my eyes open when I do something. Yeah. And what I noticed was when you said pleasure, noting the pleasure is activating that interplay so, and it kind of goes mm. around and around there's the deepening of the breath but also your mind says ah i like that i can relax into that yeah that's yeah. what i'm looking for with pointing to the pleasure often in zen we're a little suspicious of pleasure because we don't want to get caught in the pleasure but <clears throat> honestly after 37 years of practice i think um my conclusion is we could all use a little more pleasure in the practice because with it creates a natural draw, you know. So, so what we're looking at is things that that um, pique our interest and start to draw us in. So we're not pushing ourselves into our practice, you know. Oh, how much can I notice about the breath? You know, it isn't constant either. It's not constantly that you're noting the pleasure. It's just a, might come here and there. Um, yeah, this feels good. This yeah, feels okay. And, and then yeah. you deepen. And then you deepen. And it, yes, exactly. The, Nah. If we can access, we were born with with the uh, tendency to go towards pleasure and avoid pain, right? Mm -hmm. So we can use that in practice. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, first and second noble truth and all that, grasping after pleasure is not going to bring us ultimate happiness. But noticing uh, the subtle pleasure that will deepen as we as we get deeper into our practice, that's very helpful. We can use that aspect of the mind sometimes we've forgotten as adults because we get so responsible we forget that that hey it's okay to just chill out and have a little pleasure you know so um and when we start to feel the pleasure of it um it's like we're in a warm bath and we're enjoying that and the telephone rings are you going to ruin the bath by getting out to answer the phone mm -hmm. um I hope not, because they're just going to be trying to sell you something, right? <laughs> and, and it's going to ruin your nice, relaxing bath. So we're in this bath of the exhale of the pleasure of paying close attention. And the telephone of the mind rings. 
bringing up a uh, line of thought that we could easily get caught in. Are we going to answer it? We're going to be less inclined to answer it because we know it's going to wreck this feeling, right? So uh, what we're looking for in Chikin Taz or just setting practice is we want it to be, yeah, there's effort involved in kind of accessing it, but fundamentally it's an effortless practice. So if we could find the path where we're drawn in naturally rather than efforting to go into the practice. That's what we're looking at. So, um, so that's part of why I'm pointing to these things to try and pique our interest because I got into meditation because I was interested in the first place, you know, and, and uh, um, so we don't want to lose that initial spirit of, Hey, what's here. I'm, un I'm trying to understand the, the deep, uh, truth of my life and my own mind, you know, um, that's an exciting adventure. You know, it's not nothing. It's not a passive endeavor just to uh, calm ourselves down or whatever. So there's, uh, if we can find that natural way in, it's, it's just so helpful. I want to point to one other thing. Um, uh, sci uh, brain science has shown us uh, something that actually doesn't appear in the ancient texts. Um, it's that uh, the brain, <coughs> our attention functions in two dimensions at once. And they know this brain science because it lights up different parts of the brain. So we're paying that close attention to that place in the body, right? Where, we, where we're really feeling the breath. Uh, but at the same time, our peripheral awareness continues to function in a broader way. And I want to work with that next, but we've all heard that we can't multitask and it's true, but multitasking is using that focused element of the mind, which is what we're using when we focus on that one point and trying to switch between multiple focuses that doesn't work. Right. But we actually all know, that the broad awareness functions at the same time as the close attention functions, because uh, if we're driving in our car, listening closely to a song, singing along, it's our favorite song, or thinking about, you know, some something that's completely um, drawing our full attention into focusing on that, and a cat runs in the road, we'll hit the brake, right? Because we hope we will, because our broad attention our peripheral attention is still functioning. So I want to show something about peripheral versus one point of attention. So if we can go back and again, let's just work with the exhale for now. Let's keep it simple. Let's go back to that one point. See if we can really drop our attention onto those ever changing sensations of the exhale. just for a few rounds of breath. Now I'd like us to notice that in our peripheral attention, we can notice that the whole body relaxes naturally during an exhale. The body, mind, and emotions all tend to relax during an exhale. And there's a way to balance the broad view of appreciating that, which incidentally, that feeling of relaxation throughout the body is also pleasurable. And if we notice it and appreciate it, it will deepen. And I know this, these seem like really fine points, but this is the stuff we tend to skip over in our Zazen because we're trying to get to the big things, right? But these, the little things are the big things is all I can say. Can we notice that it's true to tune into the peripheral attention, take some of the attention away from that one pointedness, but it doesn't take it all. Can we just try and feel that the balance of those two perspectives of our attention? Notice the pleasantness of it.
<clears throat> so this is something to continue to work with, but the reason I emphasize this is um, that our broad attention is what allows us to Number one, notice how steady our awareness is, uh, how our application of attention is. The natural tendency, if we're not looking at the continuity of our attention, is it's suddenly going up and down and tuning out and focusing in. That's like turning, uh, it's like turning uh, a flame up and down, up and down, up and down on the teapot. And it's going to take a long time to get tea, right? What we want is a steady flame. Um, so the broader part of awareness can be watching that continuity. Uh, the, the more continuity, the deeper we go, the more, the more pleasant it is. So it all fits together. Also, the broader attention can watch for that thought that's just about to come over the horizon, that ringing telephone that's going to take us out of the path, right? Um, and if we catch that soon, and we keep our eye on the thought, very often, if we're really immersed in practice, you probably have all experienced this at some time, that often people often experience it during retreat time. If you keep your eye on the thought, you can just watch it as it crosses the sky like a cloud and, and goes away. Um, if we don't catch it as it's arising and it takes hold, next thing we know we're thinking about a million things, right? So, it can take a little while to get the sense of this balance between the close attention and the broader attention. Um, there's this really interesting book called The Illuminated Mind, which is uh, uh, written by um, Kula Dasa, whose other name is John Yates. He's a brain scientist. He's also a sanctioned teacher in the Theravadan and a Tibetan lineage. Um, I can write it in the chat for you later. Um, but he's been through all the ancient texts in great detail and compared them to brain science. And this is where some of this comes from. And I found it really helpful because sometimes we have, the, we have certain experiences in practice, especially during session times, retreat times, but we often don't know how did this happen? What is it? And uh, will it happen again? And, and all, sometimes the deep experiences don't happen in our home practice, but there, are, you know, we tend to be um, light on technique in the Zen world, but there are known techniques, some of which I'm sharing with you, that can touch up fuzzy areas of our practice. Okay. I had a friend uh, come and sit on one of my university meditation classes and uh, she was a 30 year practitioner. And after class, she said, it never occurred to me to, that I could watch the whole progression of, of a breath beginning to middle end and be interested in that. She's a developed practitioner. She'd obviously gotten some, some growth from her practice, but it was kind of amazing to me that for 30 years, I didn't quite know what she was doing. I, I suspect her attention on the breath was rather nebulous, rather distanced. You know, uh, getting closer brings us deeper. More, more continuity of attention brings us deeper. These are the things. Following, rather than struggling, if we can follow the path the mind would like to go because it's interesting and pleasurable, there's a lot less struggle. We get drawn in. Okay, so. Um, I know we covered some of this last time, but just not everyone was here. So I wanted to do a review and then we'll move on a little bit. But before we do, I just want to point to two more things we did last week. One is, where is the hara actually? Um, so we hear that the hara is a couple inches below the navel and we try and allow our attention to drop to that point. It's um, in Chinese, it's called the Dantian in uh, uh, and in uh, the yoga systems it's the second chakra right so <clears throat> it's a it's a point that raises our energy and uh, and helps awaken our intuition and our spiritual power and focus um, 
it really helps to find the specific point where it is. So um, the way to find it is if you take your fingers and you, and you place three fingers right below the navel, right in the center line of the body, and press with each finger and see if you can find the point that feels the uh, slightly tender or slightly active. There's a particular acupuncture point. That's the point. Um, one of those spots will feel more, um, you know, a little bit like a pressure point or a little more um, sensitive than the other points. If you travel back from that point to the center of the body, and at the same time, if you tighten the perineum, the lowest point of the abdomen, which is the point we tighten if we're trying not to, not to pee, you know, if we're trying to hold, hold our urine. So if you tighten that up and find the center of that point, I know this is nerdy and precise, but it pays off. <laughs> um, and you draw a line up from that to meet the line that went back from below your navel. In the middle of the body, to place those two points meet, is pretty close to where the hara is. It's said that the center of it is about, in, in Qigong practice, which really emphasizes this, it's said about that it's about the size of P, maybe. Once you've found that point, move forward and back, side to side, and up and down until you feel like you've hit, um, there's a particular feeling to it that is some people experience it as, as heat, some people experience it as, as a kind of pressure, some people experience it as um, a kind of magnetic feeling. Can I just see a show of hands of who can can feel what I'm what I'm pointing to? Can you just you know without disrupting your practice? Yeah, okay. So the um, the thing about when you really find the center point of it, and it may be a little further back than you think, and it may be different in different people. But again, there's a certain, um, well, a magnetic feeling. If we allow it to, it will draw the mind to it. it there, it's got, we may be trying to get there, and we may use that whole feeling of relaxation in the body and gravity drawing us down to see if we can just let our attention drop there. But at the same time, there's something about that point that wants to draw our attention. I wonder if you can feel that. And if we allow ourselves to be drawn to it, there's a, that, fe that pleasant feeling increases. I'll just put it that way. Maybe it's more than pleasant. Uh, maybe it feels somehow significant to, if the mind can really meet the body at that point. Of course, we're still feeling the breath coming and going. I wonder how many people could feel that pull. Can I just do a show of hands without disrupting your, your attention too much? Right. So I can tell you it's a lot more effective practice if you can find that magnetism and let yourself be drawn to it than to try and push yourself there. A lot of people try and work with the heart and they try and push their attention down there. It doesn't really work. There's one more thing I want to review from last week if we can go back to. Let's keep ourselves centered in the hara. If we can manage to connect, if we can't quite connect, that's fine. Allow that feeling as though of gravity to just keep drawing that we use that image of the rock, which is our attention. Just keep drawing it deeper. One day, one meditation period, one sashin, it will connect and you'll feel, you'll feel that there's a natural resting place there where the mind likes to rest. So if we go back to noticing our exhales, we're centered in that point, but we're also more broadly noticing body's relaxing. It's okay during the course of an exhale to do a little scan of the body. In fact, I recommend doing this 
at the beginning of Zazen periods to see if there's anywhere you're holding overt tension. And you just stand head to, or head to hara. And it's as though your mind just is sweeping away any tension that feels ready to let go. There's always some residual tension. During the course of the exhale, the relaxation naturally deepens. We spoke about this last time, at the very end of the exhale, just right in the turning point before the inhale begins. You may notice a moment where everything seems to stop, a kind of still point. If you should notice that, see if you can allow yourself to sink into it. Again, there's that feeling of pleasure. And as you begin the inhale, just see if you can invite a little of that stillness to stay with you. It can't be grabbed after. But if we notice it and appreciate it, just like the relaxation response, it'll tend to keep it. Also, it has a sense of a draw to it as well. That stillness is attractive. So now can we connect up the other half of the breath, the inhale, and see if we can invite some of that stillness to stay with us, invite that relaxation to stay with us through the inhale so it doesn't go away, so we don't tighten up again. If you lose touch with the still point, Many people find it again in the turning point between the inhale and the exhale. I know this is all very precise and nerdy, but I promise you there's much there to help your practice. If you don't find it at the top of the breath, look at it, look for it at the end of the breath. If you keep touching that point and keep surrendering to it, Since that point is at the bottom of the breath, it seems to me in some peculiar way to um, be related to the hara. It's as though I feel the still point there in the hara. And that makes a fairly potent magnetic draw if you just let your mind be drawn to the stillness and to that place in the body. Let's just see if we can practice with that for just a couple of minutes. I'd like you to notice that if you can settle in the still point, even if only for an instant, there's an effortless quality. It's like that buoyant quality grounded at the same time oddly. It's like that buoyant quality that uh, Futai talked to, talked about, spoke about. Can we just let ourselves be drawn in there and see if we can align or relax into that or surrender to that particular feeling of stillness. See if you can also balance your broader awareness to catch intrusions from the thinking mind, to catch that ringing telephone before it takes hold. It's as though we're saying, I see you, thank you, but I'll get back to you later. Just let it go. For some people, it's comfortable to allow there to be a pause between the breaths. It doesn't have to be an overt pause. It's a pause. Don't try and make a pause or extend a pause if it feels uncomfortable. But if it feels comfortable, 
you might just allow that pause to linger or that turning point to linger until the in-breath starts all by itself. We use that broad attention to kind of survey the body to encourage us not to lose our relaxation during the inhale. And also to watch for continuity. We can start to take that continuity of attention from the exhale into the inhale. Perhaps we can join up one full cycle of breath with really consistent continuity. If we do that, the whole feeling of stillness and absorption and immersion will deepen. And if we can perhaps go for another round, really keeping the attention continuous, we'll go deeper yet. I don't want you to think that we're looking at a bunch of different things. It's all one thing. We're centered in the stillness, in the hara. Fully aware of the breath coming and going. Our broader attention is watching for continuity and interruptions. It's all one. It's all of a piece. See if you can find that. Okay, let's give this a try. This is the place I've been wanting to get to. You stay with that feeling of stillness and let go of all technique. Be fully aware, but you, this is where we go into non-doing. Can we find the, that, that still point, particularly if reinforced by the horror, can we just stay there? without having to do anything till we find an effortless quality of just resting in stillness and awareness. So this is awareness without a particular object. That's what Shikintaza fundamentally is, an effortless awareness. It does have this particular feeling to it of being located in that stillness. But it's a natural practice we would have to exert energy, we would have to do to leave this place. If a thought came by, we would exert some energy to grab the thought. It's reversed to the way we often think of things, but see if you can notice what I'm pointing to. It's perfectly natural to be aware, be centered in awareness. All sorts of sensations can come and go. Thoughts may drift by. We're aware of what's happening, but we're just centered in pure in awareness rather than letting every object of awareness grab our attention.
Okay, I want to make sure we have a chance to talk about this. So it can be hard to talk after after practice. Um, of course, we have to do that all the time because we go into Doksan and, and uh, talk to our teachers. So that's part of Zen training is to come in and out of these um, uh, practice as needed, you know, or to carry the practice forward even into talking and interacting. So how many people could find that effortless quality? I know that's a lot to put to all do at once. Fortunately, we have recordings. You can go back and look. at. Could you feel the effortless quality? Could you feel, could you feel if you drop all doing that you could just stay there? How many people could feel that? Yeah. If you, if you're not quite feeling it, keep, keep, practicing with it. Actually, I was looking at the people in the meeting room, so I wasn't seeing you all at home. I saw Eddie Lee raise his hand, but how about the others at home? How many people could see that? Yeah, I could feel that. Okay. Okay. So, um, Shikantaza, just sitting practice. Once we're there, that's what we're doing, <laughs> right? But everything we went through, some of which was repeated from last week, a lot of which was repeated from last week, uh, is um, an avenue to get there, right? Now, you're not always going to be going through all those steps and all that avenue. It becomes, um, it becomes easier to drop to the hara. It becomes easier and more natural Actually, we're always balancing close attention and broad attention. You know, we're focusing on something in uh, on our computer, some some very focused task, and all of a sudden, there's a dog fight outside. Well, you're going to run to the window, right? Your peripheral awareness is going to take that in, right? So, these are natural abilities, but by appreciating, letting ourselves be drawn into them, and noticing. Um, how many people found, once you got to the non-doing place, how many people found it was really rather pleasant, quite pleasant? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, as I think I said last week, we're a little suspicious of too much pleasure in Zazen because it is true, you can get attached to bliss, but there's things that are better than bliss, and if you just let yourself keep dropping deeper, that overt experience of pleasure will go away, but there's something more profound underneath it. So if you really feel like you're, well, you can't really even get stuck on the bliss because it won't last, right? Does bliss ever last? <laughs> Everything's impermanent, right? Even if we touch and saturate in that, that pleasure deepening to bliss, it still won't last, you know? So you might as well keep going <laughs> and find out what's, what's beyond that. Um, but if you ever feel like you really get stuck there, you can talk to me and Doak's <laughs> Um So, yeah, so I'd, I'd just like to hear, I bet a lot of you from doing retreat practice are already familiar with this state. How many people are already familiar? Because sometimes it just happens in retreat. You just notice, oh, I'm just here. I can kind of forget about the breath. I mean, you're aware it's happening, but that's your primary attention goes into that feeling of immersion, yeah? So, but in, in retreat, it, it so often things happen and we don't know how they happened. And in Zen, there is somewhat of a bias about against too much method, you know? Um, but, um, there are ways to find your way back to those deeper immersion states in home practice. And what, what often tends to happen is if we don't have a way to find our way back in our home practice, we, we won't. Or maybe it'll happen every once in a while. You know, in, in the original Theravadan Buddhism, there's a whole set of methods for getting, for going through stages of samadhi. And they're not methods you could grasp after, you know, they're not doing in that stage. They're methods that you can allow to happen, right? So 
we notice that the exhale has a particular potency in relaxing and perhaps allowing our attention to drop deeper. We, um, uh, we notice that the haras helps, is a big help in that. We notice that noticing the still point at the end of the exhale. The, the single most helpful thing for me is that still point at the end of the exhale. If I'm, if I'm sitting down and I'm scattered and I'm having a hard time settling, I'll just start with the relaxation response of the exhale and watch for the still point. And in other words, you won't always need so much method once you're kind of familiar with the map. You know, I'm basically giving you a map that can help. I know many of you are doing koans, but this applies to you too, because you're not always thinking about the koan on your cushion the whole time, at least once you're past the initial ones, like if you're working with Mu or who you may be repeating them in an almost mantric way. But after that, that's not, you know, you turn the koans over in your mind. And then I don't think you could keep thinking about, well, thinking about them is not going to help anyway. Obviously, you think about them because that's how you load them into your brain. But then then you just do your zazen. You park them on the back burner and do your zazen, right? You bring them to mind every so often. So, um, so this, what we're talking about is accessing samadhi, and how how is this done, you know? And um, and samadhi is definitely accessed through through uh, shikintaza. However, you know we're keeping an eye out. We're keeping an eye out for you know, we'll be in this lovely, effortless place. And next thing you know, we'll be thinking about something else because we didn't catch the thought when it started to come in, right? And next thing you know, it grabs us and there's that amnesia to thought. Um, this is kind of the whole enchilada. There's something else. That's an ancient Buddhist term, by the way, the whole enchilada. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is kind of the whole thing of what Shikantasa is. If you touch that place where you're effortlessly practicing without having to do, that's what it is. The question is, how do you find that? And it can be nebulous and it can be easy for, you know, every, I could feel a certain moment of stillness even across the ethers. Could you feel that where everything got really still? I'm sure in your room it did. Could you all feel that at home? Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, distance makes no difference in things like this. I could. I could just feel when we all dropped, you know, to that stillness. Of course, one of you may have been thinking, but overall, you know, <laughs> one of you may not have been there, but, you know, overall, the group mind had kind of gone there and you can feel that. Um, so getting there ultimately becomes more technicalist as well. But um, these, these methods can be practiced. They take a little time. You know, you can't just go, okay, uh, here I am, I plugged into the relaxation response and the exhale. Now I'm going for the still point. I feel my horror, I'm off. You know, it's like, you know, it took us, what, 10 minutes or something to walk ourselves there. Um, um, but it gets, it gets easier to find that place. And moreover, um, I thought a lot about why some people really transform their lives in practice and other people it doesn't seem to take hold in the same way. And I'm convinced, I offer this to you as a true and important tip that people who are willing to creatively engage with their practice define what leads them to that place of immersion. We know what it feels like. You're entirely allowed to discover your own methods to go there. These are, I'm just sharing my methods. Um, some of them I picked up from elsewhere, a lot of them, at the still point I found by myself one day. And later I find out that other people know about that. You know, I've seen it in other places, but I just discovered in my own practice and started to practice it. You know, we're allowed to do that. Sometimes we get too passive in our um, practice and we're waiting for the teacher to tell us the next thing that's going to take us to the deeper place. And um, no, once, you're, once you've been practicing for a while, you have to find the way to go to the deeper place. The teacher's just coaching you. You know, I can't possibly know what's, you know, what's going to take Futai to that deeper place. I can give some hints and stuff, but once you're in there, I don't have the colors. Maybe the colors will keep taking into deeper stillness. If they do, ride them into deeper stillness, then let go of the colors. But, 
You know what I mean? People, people, you look for that thing that draws your attention, draws you to stillness, you know? So, okay, <clears throat> so let's have a little question and answer time. Um, who's got questions? Anda. Yeah. Would you uh, compare this or discuss the differences of, with non-dual awareness? It's non, it ultimately leads to non-dual awareness, yes. Yeah. How about, how about, I want to, there's another step that can clarify that more, which is what I want to do with you all next month in Shikantas and the exciting conclusion of the Shikantas. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes, there's a way I want to point to that. Uh, it is definitely an avenue to non-dual awareness, without a doubt, yeah. But so, is, it, is it the same or different than jhana practice? It is one way into jhana practice. The uh, jhana, the jhanas, the, which are the traditional stages of samadhi. I mean, we practice samadhi. So they're the same, samadhi and jhana are the same thing. It's just that in the original Theravadan practice, they had different delineations of levels and of, of samadhi and stuff. But basically, when you're touching that sense of stillness and absorption, that's jhanas, that's, that's samadhi, you know. Um, the oftentimes the jhanas traditionally were accessed through one pointed practice, one pointed, which is like where we, we started with trying to find that place in the body where we could really follow the breath. There are other methods too. Um, Shikantaza comes at it from a different angle, but ends up in the same place. Shikantaza ultimately, even though we use the focus technique to get there, once you once you let go of technique and you're just, you're just resting in awareness, it feels rather expansive, doesn't it? There's not a tight focus to it, is there? Um, it's, um, but it's another way, and yeah, it's definitely samadhi. And eventually you could take either method and as they deepen, you end up basically in the same place, you know? It's just different avenue. Thank it's you. a different on-ramp to the same freeway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so, he is a completely inappropriate me metaphor for stillness, huh? So. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other questions about it? Um, <clears throat> or comments? Oh, yeah. Or objections? Mine, mine is more, more, I guess, more, maybe more comments, slightly question. What I found is that, yeah, I did start feeling that moment of stillness. And for me, it feels like a really important place to, I, I feel I, that's something to really keep me, keep me going. If I can, with, yes. each, with each breath, if I can, with each out breath, if I can always remember to get to, to notice that place and find yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Or as often as you can manage. I think, <laughs> yeah. I think that'll happen a lot. I think other than that, in terms of trying to really be aware of all the different stages of breath, that'll take me a long time because I just kept feeling so much tension in my chest or, you know, there was something right. else I was feeling. that. It, yeah, it, now I was thinking of... Stay with it. I was thinking of you particularly in re-emphasizing again because you weren't here last time the relaxation response in the exhale mm -hmm. thinking of you exactly particularly uh, i you know i would say work with that for a while mm -hmm. and see if if you can just notice and appreciate the natural relaxation that happens there's still areas of tension it doesn't all drop off at once but if you can notice that there's that natural tendency and appreciate it and just see if you can carry enough attention through the in-breath to get to the next exhale without everything tightening up again, then there will be a natural process of letting, of letting go. At a certain point when you feel immersed, you can look for areas of holding and you can bring your attention there, you know. But if you base it in the relaxation response, that's going to help. You, you know, these things really aren't different. You're looking at that tension in your chest, but you're, you're aware of other things going on in your body, you know, but your one, your, your pointed awareness might be on that tension in your chest, right? Um, 
you have the spirit of inquiry. It's not a different thing. Are you, you wouldn't be noticing and working with that, that tension in your chest if you weren't interested. So you're already raising that mind of inquiry and, and interest. Um, that, thank you. I mean, that, that's what's really also really helpful for me is, is the, the difference between the, the broader awareness the peripheral mm. awareness in the center. So I'll be working very much of that. that. Thank you. Yeah, Brian. and I suspect because of what you mentioned just right now, that uh, and what we talked about earlier, you and I talked about earlier, that uh, that the peripheral awareness may be the most important for a while for you, because you're working with with the broader body awareness. But But still, if you can have a center point for your attention, it will anchor and deepen the whole experience. It'll be easier to get deeper, more deeply into the broader awareness also. They they work together. If you can find the balance, you know. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, this is non-dual awareness, so they're not all separate things. You know, I know I'm talking about different aspects of it, but it all we want we want it all to come together in a certain way, you know? <laughs>